Hi, JJ. Hello. How are you? Great. How are you doing? Good. We're having some cooler weather here in Texas, so probably not like what you're experiencing, but it's a little reprieve anyway. Awesome. Yes, I think cool is relative. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so is hot, I suppose. <laughs> hey, Wendell, how are you? Doing good. How are y'all? Well, I was um, bragging about the Texas weather today because it's kind of nice to have a little reprieve from the heat. Of course, just give me a few months and I'll be complaining about the cold. So, you know, never happy over here. Okay, I'm going to wait just a few more minutes before we get started um, in case we have a few more join us. Um, but I do want to go ahead and say welcome to everyone who's already in. And I want to encourage you or at least invite you to um, unmute yourself and turn your camera on so that we can make this a conversation. Um, and interact with one another. We can still do that even without your cameras on. Hey, thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, the, hello, everyone. Uh, the last name is misspelled, but if they're, uh, if for anyone that's keeping track, it's supposed, okay, well, be, point it's supposed to be an M instead of an N. Okay. I was about to say, I know that character, and I looked at the last name. I wonder if it was misspelled. <laughs> hey, I know it's Steve. <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, just forgive me for the particulars, but anyway, it, it's Hi, Heather. Welcome. Hello. Happy Friday Eve. Yay. <laughs> Feels good. Uh, if you all want to just use the chat box and maybe uh, let everybody know where you're from, um, what city or organization, et cetera, what, whatever you want to share. Um, but sometimes it's fun to kind of see, you know, where everybody is across the country. And it is 12 o'clock on the dot. We're going to keep this one short and sweet because um, we have a few people who need to uh, jump off a little bit early. But I hope that we're going to have some really good, robust dialogue um, throughout the conversation. And I want to give you a quick, for those of you who haven't been to one of these meetings before, um, I want to let you know that the reason we hold these uh, monthly HR collaborative meetings is so that we can provide an opportunity for people in the local government HR industry to connect with one another, collaborate, share information, encourage, support, et cetera. Um, and then also hopefully learn a, a thing or two along the way, right? So uh, we learn from each other. And then today we have a very special treat because we have JJ Peters and Wendell Medford from our SGR team. Um, and last month at our meeting, we talked a lot about kind of the um, hiring um, the recruiting and retaining of employees and the crisis that we're all feeling in the local government world right now. And so I'm, I'm looking at the people at the cameras on to see if there's any head nods going on, but I'm sure some of you can relate to that. And so I thought it might be nice to have some of our uh, internal experts join us and talk a little bit about what they're seeing and answer questions you may have and certainly um, provide advice if they can as well. So I love putting Wendell on the hot seat anytime I can. Um, so, you know, I want you to bring your questions today, um, ask the hard ones, and you can put those in the chat box or use the Q&A feature, and we'll try to get to those. And also, I did not introduce myself. I'm really bad about doing that. But I'm Krissa with SGR, and I do um, the business development for SGR. So um, I'll put my contact info in the chat box as well. And also, of course, that's available on the website. But um, if you have any follow-up questions or need anything from us, or if there's anything we can do to help support you, we want to encourage you to reach out to myself or any of the other members of our team. Uh, that's what we exist to do, is to support our local government um, people out there and encourage you to keep doing the great work you do. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. I didn't ask who wanted to go first, but... Um, since I already said I like to put Wendell in the hot seat, I'll start with, with Wendell. Do you, can you just kind of tell us a little bit about maybe what you're seeing um, as far as recruiting and retaining talent in local government, Wendell? Sure. Yeah, just give everybody a little bit of background first. So I'm the president of Interim Consulting and Embedded Services. So a.k.a. Grunt, I always throw that out. So 
Uh, on the interim side, what we're seeing here, uh, of course, is similar to on the permanent recruitment side. We're more of the crisis team, okay? So at any given moment, we'll have an agency that reaches out in need of a of interim professional because uh, they have some type of separation going on, whether that's voluntary or involuntary. And so what our team does is that we actually uh, place city managers, police chiefs, fire chiefs, you name it, all the disciplines uh, in those roles to make sure that uh, the organization remains stabilized. We also try to do some type of triage, just doing some analysis of, of where the pain points may be. Uh, they're actually embedded with the organization. They establish relationships not only with community members, but with staff as well. So by the time that we have uh, we start the permanent recruitment, uh, things, the transition uh, turns to be turns out to be pretty smooth. And so what I will share with you since program inception back 2013, 2014, uh, the primary focus was city management. Fast forward today, we're seeing several uh, requests for finance directors, HR directors, city managers, public works. And then uh, going back, I was picking with Steve a little bit earlier, but Steve actually served as the interim communications director for a, uh, a city of Irving here in the North Texas area and done a phenomenal job. So uh, very thankful for him. So uh, we have the opportunity to help transform communities and organizations during their periods of crisis. Thank you for that compliment. Excellent. JJ, you want to give us a quick intro? Absolutely. Well, I, I think I should say good afternoon. I think I might be the only one representing the West Coast here, and it's still morning here for me, but uh, welcome and thank you all for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. And I always uh, love, you know, Wendell and I uh, share a lot of similarities um, in the experience that we're doing. And he and his team are an incredible support as we have clients that are, uh, you know, actively seeking um, professionals, especially at those executive level positions. Obviously, that can be a real challenge um, for, for you all. And an executive search uh, does take a while. So we always appreciate Wendell and his team being able to, to help you with those shorter term needs. But um, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about kind of what we're seeing uh, in the labor market and then, um, you know, hoping we can open it up for your questions and ideas and, and comments as well, but I'm sure it's going to come as no shock to any of you that uh, it's very much an employee's labor market right now. Uh, we, um, if you, if you haven't if you've had the luxury of not having to recruit for some of the most sought after positions lately, uh, consider yourself very fortunate. Um, the salaries have very likely increased um, and some, and in some cases very significantly, for example, for finance professionals, um, engineers, and public works leaders, even in the last, you know, uh, couple of years. I often speak with clients who think it's just an issue for them or in their area, but using finance professionals as a great example, there's a there's a nationwide shortage of public sector finance professionals and the pool of government accountants available and applying to open local government finance director and accountant positions is really scarce. Um, so, so much so that the national GFOA is currently preparing to promote some courses that they've uh, offered for a number of years to assist private sector finance professionals in transitioning into local government finance. And I, number, I understand a number of states also are offering these courses. Uh, there's been, you know, uh, understandably long-standing reluctance in hiring private sector accountants with no government accounting experience. However, it's become a reality and a necessity with the, the labor market that we're seeing in many cases. Um, and we're starting to see that reluctance shift uh, given the realities of the labor market. So this might be a, a strategy that you might want to just be aware of or consider if you do have uh, needs for finance professionals in your organization. We're also seeing you know, those trends really continue with public works and engineering positions. Uh, another great example, especially if you're seeking candidates with a combination of um, experience and requiring a, a PE license. Um, just a couple tips for you. If you if you are doing market studies, I'd really encourage you to include a question to your um, comparables that you're reaching out to to get an idea how recently their organization may have uh, recruited to fill the position that they're seeking to fill. We're finding while salary surveys um, and market studies can be great, um, they often aren't as meaningful as finding out you know what 
um, the current going rates are uh, for uh, current positions that are being recruited for at this time, just because things have shifted so drastically uh, over the last year or so. Um, Another tip, you know, salaries on job posting, it's a double edged sword and it's been really eye opening here in Oregon. It's become, you know, it, it, it's pretty common that you always see salaries posted on job postings in, in Washington state. That's just north of us. It's a requirement. They actually had a state law that was passed, not only that the salaries have to be posted, but their benefits have to be posted as well. So those are some trends that I think we're going to see continuing. But I think, you know, it's just important for us to be mindful as employers that a lot of job seekers aren't going to take the time to find out what the salary range is if it's posted, and they might just take a pass on that. So that is a risk we take uh, when we don't post the salaries. I understand why we don't in some cases, but those are just some things to, to think about. And I have a feeling we may see, you know, as pay transparency continues to expand across the nation that we'll, we'll start seeing that um, more frequently included. I would encourage you when you are um, including salary ranges to not just include the hiring range. Um, that can be you know, not really clear to a lot of job seekers. And if they're really looking to make their next move, you know, they're probably gonna know since they're in the public sector what their full current salary range is. And if they're not seeing growth potential in that next opportunity, uh, they may not you know, consider it. Um, I think, uh, you know, and I, I'd also encourage you, to, if you've got pay practices that um, stipulate that you only hire at the lower end of your salary range, I'd encourage you to take a look at that, too, because that is something that we're really seeing that um, that full salary range is having to be utilized, especially for these most challenging positions to fill. If you aren't already aware, we do... Uh, operate one of the largest public sector job boards in the nation. And it's not just for higher level positions. We have clients that are posting everything from executive positions all the way to part-time seasonal lifeguard positions. Um, and it's a steal of a deal compared to many other advertising sources out there. I'd also encourage you to uh, Google uh, salary ranges and years of experience requirements for positions comparable to those that you're recruiting for. Um, that's another conversation we're having with a lot of our clients. And I know Wendell and his team are as well to you know, just explain kind of what we're seeing out there as far as years of experience. And um, you know, I think looking where you can to rather than requiring 10 years, could it be eight uh, or could it be five? Um, you know, Really figuring out what's the true minimum. You can always have your preferences, but I think, you know, trying to cast that net as far and wide as possible uh, for these difficult to fill positions by only including minimum requirements in the job posting and eliminating or minimizing preferences. I think data shows um, and studies have shown that a lot of potential candidates, particularly females and people of color, tend to self-screen out at a higher rate if they don't meet all of the requirements and uh, the preferred experience for the positions. Um, and then I think, you know, finding a way to make your job posting and your opportunity stand out. Um, try to avoid copying and pasting those job descriptions while they absolutely uh, serve a purpose. Um, and with all due respect to our class comp colleagues, very few job seekers ever read a job description and get super excited to apply for a job. So I think uh, do what you can to uh, show how exciting your opportunity, your organization and or your community are and set your opportunity apart from the rest. And goodness gracious, please mention your mission statement and the benefits you offer. Uh, you are, if you're offering something that's unique or, or flexible um, about your organization or what you offer, um, those are the things that are gonna entice those candidates to, to take a closer look and really uh, take the time to apply. And, you know, remind your hiring managers of the importance of keeping the process moving as efficiently as possible um, and the candidates are interviewing us just as much as we're interviewing them. So I think we all recognize that the public sector hiring process takes longer than the private sector and communication and engagement with prospective candidates is critical um, and it can really make a difference in them choosing your job over opportunities, other opportunities they may be considering. So with that, I'll, I'll take pause. Awesome. Thank you, JJ. Um, Wendell, do you want to weigh in on any of that or add anything? Yeah. Well, JJ, JJ just made it so difficult. That's a tough act to follow. I'm going to go a little bit deeper on a couple of things that JJ mentioned. So she talked about, I, I call it more of a branding, community and organization branding initiatives. So it goes back to this. Whenever you have prospective um, applicants, developers, business owners, 
they're shopping around for communities, right? So when you go, you know, even when it starts with your website and social media presence, uh, some organizations have a, t a, a tendency to uh, post stock photos. You want to try to avoid that, right? Use more genuine photos, things that promote your organization, the culture there. Uh, that's going to make sure that, you know, if I'm shopping for a community, <laughs> I've done my due diligence and it's going to uh, attract me and attract more candidates there. The other piece here, we talk about just in your traditional recruiting uh, and uh, retention efforts. Uh, back in the day, you know, you could get away by using uh, a eight and a half by 11 uh, job description posted on a or printed on a car stock piece of paper and that would work. But now that things have changed, right? So we're in the world of uh, social media and, and website presence. So you want to take a look at your brand and all your collateral, make sure that it's in inviting and engaging. I will share with you when I first started out in uh, local government years ago, uh, my friends asked me, hey, what do you do for, for the city? Do you drive around in a white truck? Because they had no idea that there were other <laughs> services that city offers. So uh, just it's always a, a perfect opportunity to share some of the wonderful things and the services that your city offers. Excellent. And I want to remind everyone to use the chat feature to ask questions. Those can be specific to what is going on in your organization or general overall. Um, but we want to invite you to ask those because I know this is a pain point for so many people. Uh, I was going to ask this for JJ or Wendell. So I, I read something recently that was talking about how the generation that is now entering the workforce is really motivated by mission and cause and, you know, making a difference. And so, you know, I look at that and think, well, gosh, what a great opportunity for a local government organization who is doing such great work and serving the public community. But ha are you saying that is a benefit to local governments long term anyway? Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, I've been saying that for years, I think, you know, for the longest time, and I, I think it's gotten better than it was in the past, but we we never in the private, I'm sorry, in the public sector have been able to compete with the private sector um, in many areas as far as the salaries for positions. So we have to get at, you know, what's, what's at the heart um, of these individuals. And I think that's one of the really um, positive things about this newest generation that's coming to the workplace, but I think it's always the type of people that we've tried to um, attract and really do best, best have really that that heart for public service and making a difference in their community. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Wendell, you want to add anything? Sure. So uh, just to piggyback off that, um, more of them on the mission side. So always been attracted to organizations that are getting out and actually it's boots on the ground within their communities, whether it's, you know, some type of uh, Habitat for Humanity type uh, initiatives, or I love just like we call it Employee Giving Day, where around the holidays where we're connecting with those families that are in need, the more that you're able to get out, connect with your constituents and gain a better understanding of their needs, boy, it, it works wonders. And so we'll always take the opportunity to uh, promote those or, or pr promote those uh, different engagements. Once again, it makes it more appealing and attractive for folks of candidates. Absolutely. And I think, you know, kind of tagging onto what Wendell was saying earlier about, you know, utilizing branding and your website, you know, I've seen some organizations do some excellent videos from employees that are speaking about what they love about their, their job and things like that. And those are just invaluable and, and something that really, you know, can get at, at the heart of those candidates to be like, wow, I, I want to work for that organization or be a part of that. Can I add something real quick? Sure. Yes, please. Uh, just to piggyback on the com uh, comment about the video, it, it's my understanding or uh, trend that I've witnessed. That no one reads anymore. No one reads anymore at all. And uh, even in social media, if you can't tell the story in 20 seconds or 30 seconds or less, people are just going to bounce for that and go on. And I think this ties into the way uh, communities can you know, position or even present themselves They've got to be able to tell their story why you'd want them to or why you'd want to work for them in a, a powerful video because people will watch that, but they're not going to read the story. That's that's my comment. I think that's a great, great point. Is anyone else seeing that or anybody else want to weigh in on that discussion? 
Okay, well, I'm going to move along then. Um, and this this really ties in well. Thanks for asking, Debbie. Um, but she asked, any strategies dealing with generational differences? No. <laughs> Let me, let me just jump out there. So I think it goes back to this, uh, you know, you can't leave behind a desk. It, it goes back to uh, getting out, meeting with your, your staff, gaining a, a better understanding of what they're seeking within the organization. Uh, what we've seen in some cases where uh, we have some agencies that will reach out to us because they understand there's a, a, a transition within generations within the organization. And in order to keep things balanced, they'll reach out for some type of organizational assessment, right? And so we'll typically leads off with, lead off with uh, presenting or, or conducting some type of survey, just get a, a pulse of where the organization is as a whole, but then try to narrow down into and collect data points. Uh, some of that has to go back with, you know, some of the age and different demographic things uh, to provide to our clients. Once you're able to identify, you know, key data points and put together some type of analysis, you can work within your organizations to help address some of those changes that you're seeing. Uh, but you don't want to be behind the eight ball. Just wait <laughs> until things just manifest and then things, come, you know, they're off kilter. That's what really causes a rift within an organization. That makes sense for sure. And I love, uh, Meryl just commented and said, openness to hybrid and or remote work might be of assistance in recruiting newer generations. And I think that is a huge point. Are you all seeing that, Wendell and JJ, when you're working with candidates, that that's a that's a desire for sure. It certainly is. And I think, you know, that can look different for uh, different organizations. And obviously there's more ability to do that in some organizations and others. Some, some it's still a hard no. Others, it's like, well, we might be able to do some things and maybe not have it be as formal or, or there are um, opportunities. But I think anything that can be done in that area. And I think, you know, as far as the generational differences, I think we touched on kind of the commonness that you can find by, you know, regardless of the generation, we're finding that people that are typically drawn to public service really do have that heart to make a difference um, in their communities. But I think, you know, one of the things that, that I like to encourage us to do is when you get to that point of an interview, you know, not, not making assumptions about that person based on uh, their generation, because there can be, um, you know, differences uh, even amongst those within the same generation. And I think I always like to ask candidates a question about, you know, tell me uh, the top three three things you liked about your last job and the top three things that you would have changed if you could have. And that can give you some really good insights into what motivates that person, you know, what they like in a work environment and, and how well that's going to match with your opportunity and, and your, uh, your structure. Love that. And we talked a little bit at the last HR collaborative, we talked about hybrid work and we had a mix of organizations, some who's whose organization did adapt to that. And they have um, a lot of, it's from what I gathered, um, the majority of the participants in the last meeting, I shouldn't say majority, I really don't remember, but at least one or two, um, had a situation where they would have like rotating hybrid days so that like the office was always staffed, but people would take turns, you know, doing remote work for those who, you know, whose job suited remote work. But what about anybody um, in this meeting? Is anybody doing that in your organization? I'm curious to know or hear from you. Take that as a negative, maybe. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. We, no do, worry. Offer, we do offer um, hybrid in our um, agency. My only challenge when I do call, when we do, I do the recruitment and I call the candidates for interviews, the first thing they ask is obviously, do you offer hybrid? When can I start after I'm hired? With So to me, I feel, are you more interested in the job or just the flexible schedule? So then I also noticed um, we have staff where they do work from home and there's just a huge disconnect with staff working from home. Um, and I don't even, I mean, me and the HR consultant and obviously the directors are trying to figure out how do we get them back, you know, to just come in 
you know, in the office and it, it, it's tough, you know, after this whole COVID thing happened. Yeah. So yeah. that's the challenge we're facing, at least with our agency. I think that's an interesting perspective because I think a lot of times we hear like the success stories more often than maybe the um, challenges associated. And especially after we were kind of all forced into adapting very quickly, like you mentioned, um, it's interesting to hear, you know, some of the challenges associated with that too, because I'm sure that there are um, certainly some difficult issues when you have staff, some staff in the office and some staff remote. Anybody else encountering that right now? We offer it for some positions, typically after the six month probationary period is up. So both sides have that opportunity to see how they work and how business flows and uh, make it a little bit easier for everyone. And then that's normally one or two days a week uh, remote and then the other days in the office so that you do still have that opportunity for collaboration and team building. That's been the that's been pretty consistent on what I've heard from organizations who are offering hybrid work as an option. I like that you do the six month probationary period because that you say that's in the office, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So they have a chance to really build some relationships and put faces with names and all that. I like that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to share about how your your organization is handling that or not handling that either way? Share what you wish your organization was doing or not doing? This is the safe space, like the trust tree. Oh, here we have a comment. Michelle said, I worked for a large company that did 100% remote, then three day, wait, what does RTW mean? Remote, I don't know what that stands for. Return to work. Return to work, okay, sorry, I'm slow. Um, but still did staff meeting via Zoom. It's important to make it relevant and make employees feel like they are back in a more collaborative environment when returning to work. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely, Michelle. In fact, at SGR, we're 100% remote, but we make a, um, continuous effort to keep that collaboration and engagement amongst employees. And so we have, I mean, it's, it's very intentional um, and I think it works, but I can see where sometimes maybe it wouldn't, or maybe there'd just be challenges associated. First, just to, you know, uh, chime in what you just said about SGR, some of the things we're doing. So of course we have our weekly check-ins we just transitioned to bi-weekly check-ins but as a company but also uh, just weekly check-ins with staff which i mean <laughs> that makes a huge difference but also taking a step further we've done uh, some virtual retreats you know where we just shut things down for an hour or two at the end of the day and just allow for staff to connect and i think that's been very helpful so there's different ways that you, you or different tools and methodologies that you can implement to help keep staff engaged. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to me how effective, for me anyway, personally, um, how effective the video meeting has become. And if you would have asked me, you know, just five years ago, I would have said there's that there's no replacement. And, and not that it is a replacement, but I would have never thought it could be as effective as it is. But I laugh at myself because a lot of times now when I hop on a video meeting, I accidentally say, oh, it's so great to meet you in person. <laughs> I was like, oh wait, no, we are not in person. I have to remind myself, but we do a lot of video. There are there are days where we're in video meetings. I mean, you know, six out of eight hours, it feels like anyway. But um, but that's a great way to connect also. Um anybody else want to ask any questions? Y'all weren't y'all didn't bring the tough questions for Wendell like I was hoping. And I feel like I feel like maybe I let him down a little. No, they, they brought it. I'm sweating over here, Chris. I'm telling you. <laughs> I can tell. I can see it on your face. <laughs> what about, okay, I have one more then. Um, this one might be, I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer, but I thought it was interesting because I read on LinkedIn not long ago, and I apologize because I can't remember which state it was. Maybe, I think Michigan, maybe. Um, a city in Michigan, but I don't remember city. Um, had the blind... Um, reviews for candidates. I think they went through the municipal league for the hiring process. Do you know what I'm talking about? JJ, does that ring a bell? I thought it was interesting. So like they never met the candidates at all during the whole pro the whole recruitment process. Um, like only they only looked at paper. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that, because I thought that was very intriguing, to say the least. I don't know. I think I could think of 
several good, several bad. So I don't know that I have like an actual opinion on that, but does anybody have an opinion on that or have, has anyone tried that within their organization? I think it, I think it certainly depends on the role that you're interviewing. If you need a people person or if you need someone to be an ambassador for the department or for the community or as a public figure, you have got to one-on-one -on -one interact with this individual. Now, if you need someone that maybe, this could be a bad example, but maybe in the financial role and they're off in the corner office and all they see is a terminal all day and they just need to have background in uh, accounting, that, that's, a, that's, a different, uh, that's a different role. I think it's got to be role specific, but that may be my bias because if you need uh, an individual to represent your community, you have got to find out what kind of mannerisms they have. You know, do they use a fork when they eat lunch or, you know, those kinds of things. And I mean, that's, that could be old school, but that's, that's my middle name as in old school, but uh, <laughs> some roles, again, I think you can resort to that. But um, I just can't imagine hiring a city manager, uh, city of Irving, for example, Wendell. <laughs> I just can't imagine you do that on a piece of paper. That may be the first step on the, you know, to see the credentials right. on the piece right. of paper. But you're going to have to interact, especially when you have all these uh, uh, companies from California moving to uh, Central North Texas. I think some of these. CEOs in California would like to meet one on one with that individual. And uh, you got to make sure you got a people person. Mm -hmm. So that's my bias opinion. <laughs> I, I would agree, Steve. I think there's very few roles that don't require, you know, communication and um, interpersonal skills. Um, I have seen some organizations do that at the beginning of the process to help minimize bias um, and, um, you know, preference um, just based on people's names or geography and those types of things. But I don't know, uh, I think I'd have to agree with Steve that for most um, positions you'd wanna have, you know, maybe that's that could be the earlier part of the process, but by the end stages, you're gonna need to have that interaction with candidates. Yeah, that was kind of my thinking as well. I thought it was an interesting approach to, you know, or eliminate bias, but I also think uh, that'd be that'd be tough to not have that interaction and no personality um, of an individual, especially like you said, Steve, for a city manager position or something of that nature. Um, OK, Debbie also said our area is having a very difficult time in recruiting police officers due to shortage of officers. Anyone have thoughts on how to make a community attractive for such a highly competitive position? And I've heard this one across the board as well on. Um, police officers, public works, and city engineers is what we talked about um, in our last meeting. Absolutely. I see it looks like uh, Heather had talked about hiring bonuses and recruitment videos. I can't say enough about, you know, those, those videos and the value of them. But I think also, you know, making sure that you have uh, identified uh, ideally someone within your police department who is serving as that role. Um, we did that at the county um, years ago um, when we were hiring um, deputy sheriffs and um, jail deputies, um, where we uh, worked, the HR department worked very closely with a recruiter from the sheriff's office who their main role um, was to help with the outreach and connecting with prospective candidates. Um, so I think those are a couple strategies that I definitely encourage if you're not already um, utilizing uh, someone within the police department to be a spokesperson and ambassador to, you know, attend those job fairs with you and things like that. It, it really is invaluable. I know uh, this is so I live in a small Texas town, so this may not be applicable across the board and JJ and Wendell, you all would know better than I would anyway, but um, I know that the approach that they've taken here in our city is um, kind of the home homegrown where they recruit out of high school and send them to the academy and they come back to Graham. And so in doing that, their retention has shot up because they have people who want to live here, you know, like intentionally want to live in this town, not just a stepping stone in their career. And so I think that's been really helpful with recruitment and retention. But I don't know if that's you know, like I said, that may not be applicable for a city like Fort Worth or, you know, so on and so forth. 
No, that's a great one. And I think, um, you know, most organizations have, I'm, I'm sorry, most communities have, you know, the community night out events and having those police, you know, the, if you bring the the cars or the canines or whatever it is to have them out there interacting and, you know, to get that interest from a young age and have positive experiences with police officers. I think those are, are great avenues and it's never too early to start recruiting for those types of positions. Wendell, you want to add anything on that? No, I just noticed we got a special guest. Uh, me and this guy, we actually, uh, when we talk, we talk about police and fire recruitments. We actually conducted boots on the ground effort. Chris, going back to what you mentioned, like connecting with your local high school, but getting out out there in the community as well, just sharing what you have to offer, uh, and it it works wonders. I'll tell you, uh, because it's not just so much about pay, right? Uh, you know, your public safety folks want to know they have the support of upper management of leadership as well, and so it's just. It's a, it's a difficult time being in the public safety space. And so that means a lot when they know that uh, you as a city manager or, or peers have their back when should something arise. So I also um, will mention this because I think it might be something that others are struggling with. But I heard recently from a group, I won't name any names or organization names or anything, but they said that they are having their employees contacted directly from other from neighboring cities with huge incentive bonus offers starting bonus offers to recruit is that something that we're seeing just across the board happening right now just because the labor market is so tough right now speak addressing what you just said Chris is uh, yesterday I saw an ad in Oklahoma City uh, I guess it, I guess it was in the Daily Oklahoma my office is in Oklahoma City by the way Anyway, for the first time ever, I, I saw the signing bonus for Oklahoma City police officer, and it was either ten thousand or fifteen thousand. Couldn't believe it, because I kind of keep trying. I know a lot of officers and uh, the chief of police here in Oklahoma City, and uh, so I kind of stay in touch with what's going on. Two, three years ago, you'd never, never would have seen a, a bonus or anything like that. So I'm sure other states and other cities have been doing bonuses for quite some time. But for that to even happen in Oklahoma City, where they really haven't had any problem in recruiting, is amazing to see this ten thousand plus dollars sign-on bonus. And uh, so, if it's happening in good old conservative Oklahoma City, you can imagine what's happening in other cities across the, the uh, country. Yeah, that is that is wild to me. Um, and I wonder. I mean. JJ Wendell also, like, do you think that, I mean, we reach a point where it starts to turn back around, so to speak, or just maybe stabilize uh, where we were not in this like crunch of trying to find employees? I mean, I know you can't predict the future. I won't ask you to do that, but what what are your thoughts on that? It certainly does ebb and flow. I think, you know, we see these these um, times come from time to time. And I think, you know, right after COVID happened, it was a great opportunity for some smaller organizations to recruit uh, officers from larger agencies who were right in the middle of, you know, um, a lot of the political issues and all of those challenges. I know, um, you know, that that was very helpful for uh, in the Portland area out for out, outer uh, outlying areas to be able to recruit um, because, you know, police officers in, in Portland were literally having, you know, feces thrown at them and all those types of things that they were, you know, anxious to get out there as quickly as they could. And I think we've seen a lot of individuals leave the state of Oregon because of a number of those challenges and move to more rural areas. So, I mean, I think there's, there's opportunities for that. For those of you that don't have those budgets, budgets to be, you know, offering uh, those really large hiring bonuses. But I mean, I think it'll, it'll up and flow like it does with, you know, engineers. Um, it can be very fluctuating depending on what's going on with the economy and the private sector. So absolutely. So hopefully there's hope anyway, <laughs> for being back to kind of a normal hiring situation. Um, and I think it also speaks to the importance of retention. I think keeping those huge yeah huge point um yeah and i think um i think if you all are not receiving the hr collaborative newsletter either let me know or actually i'll post the link also where you can sign up in the chat 
Um, Because I put an article in there that kind of speaks to some of that anyway. Um, I try to try to include things that will that will help you out. Um, Let me put this link in here really quick. And then um, I don't think uh, we have. I I liked your comment, Debbie, because that's important too. Like who you're competing with and what the you know what's the attraction there. Um, But that's certainly a good point as well. So I'm, I'm going to, unless somebody else has another um, question, I'm going to do a quick poll. It only has one question, so it will not take you long to answer, I promise. Um, but I'm going to launch that really quick. And tell me if you can see it, because I'm not always great at this. Can everybody see that? Oh, good. I'm getting responses. And when you click the link for the HR newsletter, it's the um, subscription to our to any of our newsletters. So you'll just scroll down and click the one that says HR Collaborative and you subscribe. All right. Thanks, y'all, for answering the poll. I'll do one um, completely shameless plug because I love you guys. Um, And that is for our Servant Leadership Conference, which is coming up in January on the 25th and 26th. Do we have any uh, former attendees from Servant Leadership Conference? JJ's like, yep, I've been. (laughs) I came even before I worked for SGR. That's awesome. (laughs) One of my favorites. It is. Yeah, it's Absolutely my favorite. Uh, it's so much fun. Great time to connect with other people in local government and um, so educational, inspiring. And I love the fact that when people leave, a lot of the comments we get are they're just encouraged to go and do great work. And that is a great feeling. So we have an awesome lineup this year. I'm pay- posting the link right now so that you can have that. Thank you, Francis. Um, but it's always fun. So I hope to see you there. Um, and if you have any questions, I put my email address in the um, chat box, but also it's available on the SGR website. I'd love to talk with you more or do anything I can to help you out. So, um, but with that, we will conclude. Anybody have anything else they want to say or any complaints you want to vent out or anything like that? Thank you for the invite. Absolutely, Steve. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Hope to see you all again next month. All right. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining. Thanks. We didn't get a chance to talk about retention, but um, I do have an article that I found that um, had 15 tips that I'd be happy to send to you if you want to share that with the group. That's awesome. I would love to do that. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you all. Bye.